if you're watching, if you're watching, if you could please um, take yourself off video. Uh, I think that that's easier. Um, and then just join in. I want to welcome, uh, say welcome and thank you for joining a very important conversation presented by the CDG Marketing Committee. I would first like to thank the chairs, Antoinette Messam, Louis Sequeira, Salvador Perez, Samantha Kuster for organizing this event. And in case we haven't met, I'm your communications director, Anna Waika. The main goal is to educate you, our members, about the process of marketing and public relations in film and television. They really want to empower you as a community, how best to navigate this important area, which is really very new. That's why we don't have a lot of set rules. Antoinette says we have to learn how to advocate for ourselves. Um, and that's why education is so important um, for this committee. It's not just about making the deals, even though that's kind of the shiny part. Costume designers and their teams are so focused on pulling off the impossible every day, um, the long days of production and the many challenges and problems that come up just to create their work. That honestly, the last thing that they're thinking about is how their IP can be monetized and utilized by studios and PR firms without their consent or input. Um, it, it often doesn't even enter the conversation. So even if you don't think that this conversation relates to you, it probably will eventually. And being ready is gold. And that's what our goal is to do. It's really to focus on the positive and to put out that good energy to get everybody ready for you know, the possible. Um, I have a couple of um, examples of marketing. I do talk with members about marketing all the time. Um, first, I'm gonna say a couple of um, cautionary tales. Um, for example, uh, a couple of Oscar seasons ago, I was on a, the website of a fashion brand and I noticed that they were taking credit for the work of one of our designers. And so I happened to know their agent. So I immediately contacted their agent and said, oh my goodness, um, what are we gonna do about this? And so we worked with the designer to change the narrative in the press. We created talking points, social media, um, letters to press outlets. It was actually a lot of different parts to try to change this narrative because they were a very important fashion brand. And, um, Eventually, the agent and the designer were able to change the mind of the fashion brand by just pointing out that they were really um, limiting the possibility for this designer's chance at an Oscar, which would have um, benefited everybody. So the fashion brand came out and just began to advocate for the designer, which is ideal. Um, in many instances, uh, a designer realizes after their show is done that marketing or PR has, you know, used their IP for a collaboration with a brand they've never heard of, for clothes they've never seen, and it's very disappointing. I can't tell you how many times this has happened. And not only were they not included financially, um, the product was mediocre, which was almost more insulting when their design was so cool to begin with. Um, one of the first stories I heard about marketing was uh, when Banana Republic partnered with AMC for Mad Men. So that was a while ago. Uh, the first season, they just curated looks based on uh, the collection. But in subsequent seasons, they used Janie, Janie Bryant, um, the show's costume designer, and it sold out uh, for three additional seasons. So marketing matters. And unless you start the conversation early, it's actually a lot harder to do damage control. So we want to help you with that. Our panelists are not cautionary tales. They each have a different story, as different as their design process, as different as their projects, which demonstrate the range of, I want to call it opportunities, um, that are available to all of us. Uh, one of our costume designers um, had mentioned to the marketing committee previously, um, they had several uh, successful collaborations, particularly with fashion brands. Um, members need to align themselves with the film studio policy and marketing and make them aware of the collaboration request and, and be a part of all press releases, social media posts generated by the fashion brand. They suggest that the member insert themselves contractually to approve these assets. 
which will also then be approved by the studio. They also recommend having your agent um, advocate uh, for this for you. So there's different techniques and each of our panelists are going to show you their different approaches. Uh, first of all, we have costume designer, Tracy Gigi Field, who will talk about how to be proactive. Um, Deidre Govan will speak about the contract um, and possibly Brigitte will also talk about that and how it relates to marketing. And Linda Kearns from the Matchbox Company um, will speak and she has guided and shaped many deals personally. So we really appreciate her wisdom. Um, we will hear from Frank Helmer about a sportswear spinoff from Cobra Kai, Jonetta Boone, who translated her most iconic looks uh, for Yellowstone for Shop the Scenes. J.R. Habecker is going to tell us about her Moda Operandi uh, collab for Amsterdam. And the phenomenal Denise Wingate is going to talk about Daisy Jones, which is everywhere. And I want to thank our moderator, Phil Boutte, um, who is, as you all know, an ACD and uh, cost, uh, concept artist extraordinaire. So please hold off questions for the end. We will have a Q&A following the panel. But most importantly, I encourage you to be a part of this conversation, not just today, but ongoing. And we understand that, you know, maybe you can't attend marketing meetings. Um, I can't attend all the marketing meetings. And sometimes I listen to them on my AirPods just to catch up because there's so much valuable information uh, conveyed there. And, you know, we're learning as we go and we're taking this in very positive um, perspective. And the better that we work together, the closer that we work together, the better our collective experience will be. So thank you. Is Phil going first? Is it me? What What are we doing? What are we doing? Somebody tell me. Oh, you're you're muted, Sal. I believe it's you, Tracy. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. Just checking. All right. Hi. So I'm Tracy Gigi Field, and I'm here just to talk about like um, basically self promotion and what I do when I first um, start a show. So. Uh, throughout my career, right, I like have uh, made friends uh, with the PR people at various studios. Every time I start a show, I figure out who our PR people are. Um, I reach out, I say, hey, how you doing? I'm so excited about, you know, designing the show. Um, you know, as we go along, like I'd love to talk about like promoting the looks, etc. cetera. Um, and then as I'm going along, I do reach out to them I uh, periodically. And I basically, I um, I just feel like if you're not advocating for yourself, then who's going to advocate for you? Um, and then the, another thing that happens is that these PR people end up going to different studios. And so wherever you go, you kind of know someone, I find. And so it's easier as you go along to start reaching out to these people and being friendly. You follow each other on Instagram. You like create a relationship, right? So when it's your turn to like reach out to them, it's like not weird. You've created this like friendly environment about wanting to self-promote. Um, the other thing that I feel like is super important is the more excited you are about your designs, the more excited everyone else is about your designs, right? I talk to the showrunner, I talk to the actors, I talk to everyone about like how great whatever it is that we're doing, right? Um, and sometimes you pick up on other people talking about the clothes when you go to set. And then that's also just an easier way for you to segue into the conversation about how we can promote the costumes. Um, I think that's like basically my overall perception of like what I do. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I mean, obviously I reach out to Linda as well, um, just about uh, what we can do. The other thing that I think that I would like to mention is just about the press, right? In terms of like having your uh, designs highlighted in the media some sort of way. Um, I've also made friends with various um, uh, journalists, right? We also follow each other on Instagram. We also like tag each other in like fun, like costume things. Um, and that's another way for them to stay um, 
for you to be on their radar, right? Because they see your posts. And if you're posting about your costumes and you're posting about whatever, then they see that. And then sometimes they just read out, reach out to you directly. And they're like, hey, I just saw X, Y, and Z. I'd love to like highlight or promote like whatever it is that you're doing, right? Um, so I know that this is not a comfortable place for most of us just because we didn't get into this business to be in front of the camera. We got into this business because we want to be creative behind the camera. But this is a new thing, right? Like in the last 10 years, if you don't have your Instagram going, like not everybody knows like what you're doing, how to promote like your costumes, et cetera. And so I just feel like we need to realize that this is now part of the norm, right? Like you get in, you start figuring out your designs early on so that you can like lay out an outline about how you want people to see your stuff. And then again, with the PR people for your show, you constantly just have to like say hello. I know, again, it feels sort of like awkward, but I really think that this is like the new wave. And the more you do this, the more successful you're going to be, the more awards you're going to be nominated for, the more people are going to know who you are, and probably the more you're going to be hired because people want people who are promoting whatever project that you're on. So um, yeah, I think that that kind of wraps it up. I know that part of the reason that I am as successful as I am is because I'm super passionate about all the stuff that I'm trying to do. And I am very forthcoming about sharing that energy with like everybody around me, especially the PR people, because I want them to support me as much as I'm trying to support myself. Cool? Cool. That's it. All right. We're going to go to Deirdre next, please. And then Linda. Oh, that was so good. Um, I'm... Uh... I don't know if I could really present this information with as much pep as Tracy did. Um, my approach is a little bit um, more grounded in the sense of reality and real time experience. Um, and speaking of the contract, there are three points that I really wanted to share with you based upon my real time experience with the studios and projects that I've designed, specifically for high profile IP projects where 80% of our work is a costume build or an original design. So about two or three years ago, I did a project um, which will be coming out soon, hyper creative, a lot of builds. And with the help of the CDG, I created my own key points that I wanted to have represented in my deal. Um, my team, my agents were very supportive of it. They knew front and center about the importance of marketing. And they also knew the importance and the value of advocating for our original designs and how we could work together with the studios that ultimately control the IP over anything that we create. Um, and in so doing so, I created a template of bullet points when I sent over to be added to my overall deal memo. Um, there was a very lengthy conversation and then several emails exchanged to and from both the studio and the distributor and my team. Suffice to say, the key things that I was advocating for was credit, uh, frontline credit with the DP, with the production designer. That was the main one for me. And then in addition, the ability to market original designs in conjunction with their efforts and to somehow create a program where I could benefit from that on the outside, which is the ancillary marketing that we've been talking about, how we can financially benefit from our designs as well as the studio benefiting. So a couple of weeks later, I got a reply back that they had agreed to advocate to get me frontline credit um, by a waiver. And we do know that there is an existing precedent in the DGA that is in their contract that they get first rights to have the art direct, sorry, the um, AD, UPM, line producer, so on and so forth. There's a reason why they are listed first. However, costume designers are rarely listed with the creative department heads because we are seen as technical as opposed to creative. So this was something that I had really fought for hard for. The line producer at the time had agreed to the waiver and submitting that to the DGA, which he did. Um, and I was excited for that. 
the other piece of the project is that I had asked about merchandising and to be a part of that. They did not agree to that in the contract. However, they advocated and said, we 100% want her to be a part of it off of anything that we create post when the show airs. And this would be reflected in the final contract. Eventually, I received a digital uh, deal memo, which a lot of um, our the payroll houses are now um, submitting digital deal memos, and I signed it, and it did have the language in there. The waiver was in there, as well as the opportunity to partner on merchandising opportunities. At the end of the production, and this was an eight-month-long project, I received post after I had finished my part of the job, I had received a 28 to 30 page long revised agreement. This was not my long form, this was a revised agreement. And all of those points that were clearly discussed, outlined back and forth with emails with my agency no longer existed. What came in place was an inducement clause. And this is something that I had never experienced before, I had never seen, and it was a first. So I had inquired what it was, and basically it is an agreement and an understanding. However, that is based upon the favor of the party initiating the agreement. So without getting too much legalese, because it is very um, uh, weighty, basically anything that I asked for, I could not do. I could not post illustrations. I could not market on my own via social media. I could not advocate for any original designs that I did and a collection thereafter, it was extremely strict. And I fought it and I did not sign it and I waited. Mm -hmm. And eventually the lawyers came calling and I had to sign. So I just want everyone to be aware that the studios are very hip to what's happening, what we're doing. Um, I do feel that we do have allies. So my position is not of a aggressive antagonistic approach, but it's more informed. And really I rely on the contracts and I rely on our union and guiding us to help us understand the nuances and the differences. Contracts matter, our deal memos matter, and you wanna make sure that you are advocating not only for yourself, but for the work that you're going to create. Um, the other thing I wanted to speak on is closely linked to Tracy's point. On the shows that have a lot of hyper creativity or original designs, I get out front, I partner with the PR team. And what I noticed on my last show is that that was very successful. They actually did not know or understand the crucial importance of the designer. They knew it in theory, but they didn't understand how important it was for us to guide their process during gallery shoots or any marketing that they may do for the show. So I literally stepped in in a moment when there was a shoot happening and I said, hey, what's going on? And they're like, oh, well, we're trying to get some, some photos. Now this was happening in real time and my deal covered this, that I was supposed to be a part of any press, any gallery shoots, anything that was happening. But for this certain circumstance, I was unaware of it. So I found out about it and I walked over there and I introduced myself to the PR team on set. We were on location, they came from LA. And the bottom line, they heard my plea, they understood the value of design and they said, yes, what do you recommend? What should we photograph? What's most important? What's going to tell the story? And from that point on, they were my ally and advocating for me and saying, no, you should be here. We're going to have another shoot. Please send us some ideas of what you think would be best to tell the story and how we advertise this show. So that was quite successful. And I felt it was successful because we weren't hiding behind emails. We were doing a personal conversation. And then there was an agreement put in place. But I feel this position of saying that things are in your contract, which they should be, and then advocating on that and saying, hey, you know, this is what I agreed to in my deal. I should be here, or can we have a conversation? I think they really engaged in that way because they knew ultimately that they were in violation of what was in my contract and what I had asked for initially in my deal points. And the last thing I think I wanted to touch on is just really knowing the contracts, not just your deal memo is sufficient, knowing the contract you were working under. Um, 
as vice president in 829, we often get calls of people who don't know the contracts that they're working under. And your contract that you're working under is really instrumental in helping you understand what your rights are, what the guardrails are, what is and what is not. A lot of us work on locations. The contracts are different based upon what you're working under and where. Um, there's the Hollywood Basic um, ASA majors and tiers. There are differences. So what I try to do is when I do take a job, I familiarize myself with the contract language and make sure that my deal is in alignment with that contract and the additional things that I'm asking for outside. Um, and that's it. That's all I have to say on that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to pass it over to Linda. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hi, um, thank you for inviting me. I am very pleased to be a part of this. I, for those of you who I haven't met, um, I work for a small boutique agency called Matchbook that has been working with costume designers for over a decade now um, in brand collaborations and licensing and press opportunities. Um, I have learned a lot in the last decade in doing these kind of collaborations. I still am learning every day. Um, I am going to share a few key learnings from, um, from the collaborations that I have been involved in. And, um, you know, I'm available as a resource, you know, just call me, I'm happy to share past experiences with anyone who thinks they, they may have an interest in doing this. Um, first off, uh, no deal or project is the same. Every single one of the probably 100 I've done in the, the 13, 14 years I've been doing this is different. Um, and it, it changes depending on the costume designer's interest, the studio, the brand, the project, the timing. You know, so many things go into every single kind of project you might be working on. Um, the second thing is, and JR can talk to this, they're a lot of work. Um, you know, they take time to really make happen, um, particularly some of the larger ones we've done, like J.D. Bryan and Banana or Mandy or some of the ones Salvador has done. Um, they really involve a lot of input and um, and uh, in hours. And, you know, while, while you may be compensated for many of these things, the return per hour generally isn't great. Um, the costume designers aren't doing them to get rich. I mean, they're doing them to be credited, recognized and compensated fairly for the value that they're creating, which is key to it all. And I think uh, as Tracy and, and hit on earlier, you know, kind of just increasing your awareness, increasing your recognition, increasing your presence as a costume designer truly happens through these some of, of the, the uh, projects if they're done right. Um, to what Tracy was saying earlier, yes, I, my first advice is always to costume designers, be heard, get known, find the right people, be your own salesperson, be persistent, um, but, but there's so many different departments in the studios and networks to navigate and they keep changing. Um, the people keep changing. There's the PR people, both internally and in the agencies. There's the promotions department. Those are the people who spend the money to get traffic, to launch a new film, to um, you know, uh, advertise a new season. Those people have the money. Those are the ones that are spending money anyways. Then there's an ad sales group. There's a marketing group. There's global franchise and licensing. All these people are different. Um, and you have to kind of figure out and kind of touch base with as many as you can. There's a social media group, um, sometimes several. Sometimes there's multicultural and diversity groups that we've worked with. Then there's the awards teams. I mean, it, it's really a mass of people and a matrix in the organizations. And you never know who's going to be your advocate and who's going to be there to support you and help you and need you. And, you know, it, if you're in the right place, you might hear that people are already thinking of doing something um, and you want to make sure you're a part of it. So typically successful programs do have an advocate 
you know, whether it's the showrunner or whether it's the director or whether it's someone in the global partnerships group who really, you know, has an aunt who's a costume designer, um, which I just encountered at Paramount Plus. So um, you never know. And so just kind of like Tracy was saying, you know, kind of just feel your way around and get to know the different people. And they do keep changing and they move around a lot from studio to studio, from network to studio. But, um, you know, generally, if you have a friend who recognizes the value that you've brought to a particular project and that you as costume designers bring to telling the story and to brands, you know, they'll, they'll recognize you again next time they're working on a different film or a different show. Um, so I, I think also, believe it or not, I mean, you've probably all encountered times where people at the studios or networks think you should do something like dress mannequins or dress windows or do some PR for a brand endorsement that they're doing. And they think you should just do that because you're the costume designer on the film. Well, it's not in your scope of work to do those things for free. And they need to be aware of that. I mean, my first time working with Lynn Paolo, um, ABC thought she was going to dress the windows at Saks just for the cost of a ticket to New York. Like, oh, it's only going to take you a few hours to dress like four windows, like the scandal cast. But Lynn was smart enough to really say, look, you know, that's not my job as a costume designer. And it's gonna take more than just a couple of hours to do it right and to be authentic to the brand and represent the show most importantly and most authentically. And you know, we, we were able to get her paid for that. So usually, you know, not usually, but sometimes it's ignorance on their part. Sometimes it's intent. Um, you, just, you just never know. Um, and so I guess the other thing, I believe in strongly is that you can also do projects without the studios and networks. If as a costume designer, that's your interest, you know, you can explore those things because you're more than just the one film or TV show that you're working on. You know, you are influential people. You tell a story through wardrobe. That's valuable to brands. That's valuable to retailers. You know, you could do design capsules. You can do fashion presentations. Alison Fanger has done a few in the last year for some of the brands that she's worked with. You know, she she gave presentations at Neiman Marcus for Cinca Set that she had used on some of the characters and that she personally likes. And she gets paid for those things. So, you know, the other thing is get to know the brands. You know, you if you're closely aligned with the brands, the brands can see your value and can hire you separately from the studio or network, or sometimes you bring a brand program to the studio or network because of your relationship. So I, I just, you know, I, I'm so glad you all are having this discussion because, you know, it's, it's such an important conversation. And, you know, if, if this is, you know, furthering the awareness and, um, you know, kind of inclination to get credited and recognized and compensated for the value that, that you as costume designers and you as influential um, artists in Hollywood can bring, you know, I, I'm here to, to help in any way I can. So <laughs> I see Salvador chuckling there like we have made a little progress over the last decade, but there's still so far to go. So <laughs> I thank you very much. Back to you, Phil. Philip. Thank you so much. I mean, I've even done a, a deal project with Philip. So I mean, it's kind of <laughs> the breadth of opportunity out there is really um really great for you all. So I look forward to seeing what you all can do in the next decade. Very much so. And if I, I, <laughs> I, I can stress it enough, if you guys have any questions, please reach out to Linda. She's yeah. very knowledgeable about all of this. I mean, can really help guide you through it. Um, so thank you, Linda, so much. Um, I wanted to kind of start, I'm going to kind of cleanse the palette and then talk about this for a little bit. And then we're going to get started with some questions for our panelists. 
Um, I'm happy to be here today and I'm so glad to have been asked to participate because I know firsthand that costume designers bring uh, what they bring to creating characters and telling stories to the undeniable art that is costume design. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have worked with many of the costume designers throughout my career as a concept artist, but today I'm here to help facilitate a much needed and long overdue conversation with our esteemed panel about the power of marketing, brand collaborations and opportunities that they have had while carving a path for all of us to follow. It is, it is imperative that they be given a platform to share how the work is seen on screen and can inspire and manifest itself in a multitude of ways, including capsule collections, brand collections, shopping experiences for fans meticulously crafted in a way that brings value to retailer, brand studios and networks while crediting and compensating the talented costume designer who has worked so hard to create the character looks, our panelists all have a variety of experiences to share today that can showcase the opportunities and help us best understand how to be involved. And ultimately, costume designer involvement in these programs make them more successful. And everyone, the costume designer, the studio, the network, the brands and retailers and the fans all benefit from their involvement. So without further ado, I'm going to reintroduce the panel and then we're going to hear some of their stories. So we have J.R. Harbaker, Frank Helmer, Janetta Boone, Tracy Field and Denise Wingate. So I'm gonna start with JR. So JR, the Amsterdam Bazaar at Moda Operandi uh, was a trunk show that lasted two and a half months and just finished. It is important to make a special note here that even though the film itself was not a huge box office success, the brand collaboration inspired by your work still came to fruition. So what was in the bazaar? <laughs> Also, hi guys. Hi everybody. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about the cat who's <laughs> apparently the marketing cat, committee cat. That's my son's new kittens and he won't get out of frame. So I'm just gonna let him sit there. Um, hi, yes. The Moda Operandi uh, promotion just, just ended actually. So, and I had the ultimate pleasure of, of um, meeting Linda on that one. And then we went to the deep end of the the pool together very, very quickly. Um, you did bring up a really good point, which actually I found pretty fascinating because when we started that this concept, I had gotten, I was reached out to by the director who was doing pre-screening tests with audiences and the one consistency um, in a very inconsistent film <laughs> was that people, people really enjoyed the costume. So they kept getting uh, costume, you know, notes. Oh, I love this. I want to, you know, how, how could I get that? So that's that somebody had to recognize that in the test screening to begin with for this whole thing to even jumpstart. And then um, I think I've heard almost everybody talk about advocates. And I would say, even though every job is the same, you do really strongly need that one initial person who actually has power at the IP level, like the actual someone involved in the creative IP, um, or at least a, a facilitator of the creative IP, like somebody at the studio or the or the director owns that IP, or the studio, there's a high up executive or somebody has enough clout that they then say, we'd like to do this, you know, so, so in this case, it was the director um and he reached out to me and said we're getting a lot of you know a lot of information about people loving the costumes if we came up with something we i don't know what this means but like do you want to go away and think about this for a minute and come back at me with something um so amsterdam was a, a period 1930s film about i mean it was tonally about dada so it was a very strange request to me to ask to kind of go away and, and try and come up with something. Um, so I went away for a week and I did, it did, you know, something did hit me and I said, why don't we just center around the Dadaism of it all? That could be a fun fashion um, crossover. But I had no idea what to do at that point because <laughs> I, I, I have never done a marketing deal before. Um, so I actually, what I did was I contacted everybody I knew <laughs> and thank goodness we have this amazing community that we have. Honestly, I called Sal almost immediately. I called Antoinette. Um, I've been around Janie for many, many years and seen all the, you know, just the force of her nature get things done. So I kind of, you know, I, I knew all of her stories. I called Ariane 
Um, I called lots of people to just try and understand what I was getting into. Did I want to get into this? Um, yeah, really quickly, define yeah. creative life. Define creative IP just in case people don't know. Sure. The, you know, I, I know we were just all talking about putting this in our contract that we, you know, we would like to have our, you be involved in the IP, the um, intellectual property that we help create, which is the costumes, right? It's the, it's the property that's created on camera that then um, people use to influence different markets. Um, so, so the IP, you know, even though we would like to own our own IP right now until this, and I'm sure Brigitte or somebody will talk about this, but until this changes in our contracts, we are not the owners of our IP. We're not. And that's really important to know. It's really important to know right now, mm -hmm. because if you want to do this, you have to play ball with the structure that exists. So. We don't own our IP. Somebody else owns this IP. We sign our contracts and we say we are work for hire, you know, and the IP that we create, all of our illustrations, anything that goes on camera is owned by the studio. That being said, say, I'm Linda might be also a good person to talk about this because say we create something inspired by the creations that we made on camera, whose who's IP is that? You know, is that still the studio's IP? Is that, this is where it, this is where the territory is being forged. This is the, that's the wild, wild west that we're in right now. So um, when you wanna kickstart it though, you're, you're basically talking about wanting to create something based on what the studio has produced, their IP. So in my case, my director, and this is also really interesting. Your director may not even own the IP, you know, your director or showrunner may not even own their own IP. So I learned about that as well. Um, but in this case, the power player in the situation was the director. He still retained the IP in his contract with the studio. He still was the owner of the creative IP. So he got to say who and where and what. Um, when I spoke to Ariane, she also had a similar situation with the Kingsman line. So getting those people, um, it doesn't have to be the director. It could be somebody up in the studio system. It could be somebody in the, you know, just somebody who's attached to knowing they would like to activate the IP in a different way, in a collaboration way, in a promotion way. So um, that was the director. And that's kind of important. It's actually really important. <laughs> Someone needs to say go. <laughs> So, um, so it was his idea to, to reach out to me, but then it was, he was using me for what he knew I could do. I could creatively connect the dots and come up with an idea that would be authentic. So I pitched back to him a light version of what I was thinking. He loved it. And he plugged me in with the studios at that point. So um, then I got connected to the studio that actually owned the IP. A lot of times we know there's, you know, there's the mom and dad studio, there's the distribution studio, or there's the creative studio. So in this case, the creative studio, which was New Regency, owned the IP, or they were the, you know, co-owners of the IP with the director and the distribution studio, Disney, was just that the distribution studio so it wouldn't have made any sense to make the deal with disney initially i needed i needed the ip owners to activate so then david put me in touch with uh, new regency via their media company um and so you know this is starting <laughs> this is but this is this is this is the chair this is how this thing came came about and at that point I contacted all of the designers I knew and tried to get information about what this territory was. And Sal put me in touch with Linda. So, um, and Linda was a force of, okay, this is what we're gonna do. And <laughs> now you need to go away. And what, what items are you thinking about? What, what is your idea? And um, I remember showing Linda a full visual deck, a pitch deck, basically. Um, that I had to put together for the creative studio, New Regency anyways, just to even get them to talk to me about the idea. Um, 
so that's where that all started. That was the beginning. <laughs> Linda, there was so much more after that. I can't even remember. Um, but that that is how that started. The, the the kind of ingredients to get going were the advocate, right? And then another very key facilitator would be somebody in the marketing world that gets your concept and will help facilitate it. Without that, that could be studio support, it could be a media company support, it could be just somebody in one of these departments Linda listed off, the awards department, the social media department, the diversity department of the studio, but you do sort of, I think, need at least somebody to help you facilitate the actual marketing side. And we had, luckily, I could have taken that pitch deck and pitched it to the media company and they may not have even wanted to do it because they didn't see you know they didn't see the the value of it but it just so happens that we did land with somebody who understood the value of what we were bringing to the table and i would also say that like i fully fully agree with um what everybody is saying here is like a every project is different but the Consistency seems to be, you know, you have to speak up for yourself and you have to show our value in the situation. You have to be, you know, a lot of times, like what everyone's saying is we're, we're up against and talking to a lot of people who are fractured inside the system. And they're also, they don't know what we do. They really don't. They're, they're usually graduates from marketing, you know, um, and they have no concept of what what a costume designer's values really are, you know, what we can bring to the table, how we can help them expedite their job. You know, so part of my pitch deck was in so many ways showing them like, don't know if you know this about, you know, costume designers, but I didn't explicitly say this stuff, but, you know, we're, we're heads of department who have to design on a budget. We have to have extreme financial responsibility. We have to, you know, we, we're creatives that have to work inside of expedited timelines. Those three things are incredibly valued to, valuable to a promotional layout. They run around trying to hire people who can do those things for them. <laughs> so when I had my pitch deck, there were a couple of items we showed them. We showed them a full creative deck that was like, this is, this is the idea. Um, we also showed them a financial spread to be like, hey, you know, the financially responsible people here <laughs> are involved. And we explained that, you know, as a, the costume designer on the actual project, I was the person who could point out to them where the valuable assets were inside the project. I was the one who could say, hey, I don't know if you know you have this dress, this in this place, this seems to be, you know, I could point, I could be their navigator and tell them what was actually inside the project. That alone was a big hook for the studio in the beginning. It was just to be like, oh, here's somebody who's willing and able, and they have incredible value because they know where all of the bodies are buried. <laughs> you know, like I knew where all the assets were in on the show i knew what it was in the boxes i knew what i created i knew what didn't make it to camera that was still sitting in the boxes you know um there was a moment there where we were conceptualizing it didn't come to fruition like hey there's all these valuable dresses that were made for taylor swift and anya and margo why don't you just why don't we talk about auctioning these like would-be creations if you if they're not valuable to you now and you're just gonna you know that was an option at some point and we did talk about that that's not the way they wanted to go but um you know linda has had success with that kind of thing in the past another way so we did pitch that so that was that was really key to getting this thing out of the gate and then to speak to um, and then I'll, I'll just wrap it up because I do find it fascinating that this thing came to fruition, even even though after all the all these discussions happened before the movie came out. Mm -hmm. And it is more difficult with movies because right we're an untested product basically on the market for them they're not sure if it's going to be successful or what is going to happen, even if you have test screenings. So the movie when it hit the box office, you know it, it did not perform. 
Um, it's a changing dynamic of box offices these days. So it did not perform. And all of a sudden, they, you know, when we signed on to do this concept, they were really looking to do this as a promotional experience more than more than units. They were not in it for inventory or units. It was really a promotional exposure to get into different markets, get into different magazines, get into different arenas that they wouldn't usually be able to get into, you know, just not the traditional entertainment. They wanted it to cross over to the fashion magazines for exposure. Um, and, uh, and then when the movie didn't perform at the box office, Linda and I were, I think every day, we're like, well, this is going to go away. <laughs> They're going to pull up the rug on this. But what we were able to do then at that point was show them that this was actually, there was actually value in what we were doing, doing even for an underperforming film because of the way that Linda and I structured this particular deal, we made it incredibly economical to the studio. We found a partner that did not require inventory. So the money, as far as the upfront money went, they didn't have to put up money for inventory at all. So that was incredibly appealing to the studio. We also, Linda and I acted as an agency together. We basically said, we, the two of us, will perform the acts of, you know, all acts of creating a promotion for you. You will hire us as a promotional agency and we will deliver to you a promotion with a bow on top, finished, <laughs> completely done. You will have assets, you will have, um, we had asset management. I was involved in making graphics. I was able to hire some illustrators and concept artists to help me with product development. Um, I brought on an ACD that we hired uh, and got paid. We, we became an agency to deliver a promotion. We pitched the um, retailers. So Linda and I were the ones who took meetings with all of the retailers for the studio and we're the face of this promotion for the studio pitching to the retailers we pitched to everybody right linda i think we pitched to everybody <laughs> you name it we pitched it <laughs> uh, we set up meetings that did it we were the ones who conceptualized the brand collaborators linda and i came up with different brands she had some brands she thought would be a good fit i did but we came up with it and the studio really liked that in this instance because it wasn't Disney, it was New Regency, and New Regency was the type of studio that was used to hiring agencies to handle things for them. I feel like if we had been dealing with Disney, they would have been all up and in our business, right? But this was New Regency, and they just wanted to hire an, an agency to deliver, be like, great, here's your budget, deliver the promotion for us. So um, because we made it fast, tidy, and economical for them, and they didn't have to think about it much. In the end, when the movie didn't perform at the box office, they realized it was gonna become a self-promoting promotion that they didn't have to fund any more money into for the streaming market. Now they can move this over and start using it with the, the, with the in-home streaming team to try and, you know, now that was their focus. So they were able to be like, great, you know what? We didn't do well at the box office. We'd like to, now we have this thing that's out in the world that's gonna help us promote the film without being associated with the tanking box office. It's going to be associated with fashion and everybody likes that regardless of the tanking box office, they're still enjoying the fashion. So they were able to see the value and mostly they continued it because we did make it tidy, economical and we showed value. Um, so I think, I mean, I'll stop there. There's a lot to it. I love Linda to comment on what I just said, because I'm sure you'll say it more streamlined too. <laughs> it's, um, I'll, I'll pass it to Linda, but I think it's really important as a takeaway for you guys to listen to what JR said in the sense that these are two separate things, right? So you have your job where you're doing the actual costume design for the thing or the project, right? There's a whole other team, a whole nother mm -hmm. side to this with the marketing side, which means that you have to either have someone in place like Linda to help you kind of navigate those waters. And also it's very much so business structured. It's not artistic in some ways. It's very much so it's a whole other thing, right? The other thing is you brought up a really good point about knowing where the bodies are, right? The costume designer, you, you 
as a person that's working on the show, and I mean, that just goes for everyone, right? All of us end up knowing the project better than marketing ever will. Marketing is very hands-off, like it gets passed to them and then they're just like, okay, let's put out this visual. But as a costume designer, you are the person that actually knows like what is valuable. You know what the characters wore, you know what makes it to camera. So that's also a really important fact. I just wanted to point that out. And then go ahead, Linda, if you had some things to say, because we were talking about creative IP and stuff like that. I mean, I think JR did a, a great job of explaining the project. I mean, it was really all about having New Regency and Disney recognize the value creation that we were bringing to them but also the brands themselves felt great value, um, as did Moda Operandi. So, I mean, it's gotta be a win-win for everyone in the whole project and to find the right partners to bring on board. But I think, you know, I, I, I didn't tell you this, Jared, but I had a great call with Baron Hutz yesterday and they were involved in the promotion. They were the only brand that actually did not sell anything on Moda Operandi, but he still felt like it was a really great experience to be aligned with this property and to work with the costume designer and the retailer and gain awareness for his brand is kind of associated with Hollywood and what that brings. And he's eager to do the next project. Um, and I think every one of the brands involved as well as Moda felt like they got something from it. And ultimately I believe that New Regency and even Disney felt the value as well. And so I think, you know, normally we say Disney's impossible to work with when it comes to licensing because they are sort of the masters of it. But I think we did show a different way of bringing value through costume design projects and the relationships that, that we can bring to some of their properties. So. Yeah, I should, I'll just, the last thing I'll say is we did meet with the Disney team and um, when we came to them with the idea after New Regency, New Regency had to bless it. They were the ones who had to put up the money for it. So they had to bless it. And then once they did, we accessed the Disney team because then they said, here's our resource. We've also, you know, so talk to Disney and help, you know, they do these kinds of things, help, you know, they'll help you um, execute. We met with the Disney team and we had this concept and they looked at us with, and they said, you're gonna pull this off in two and a half months. I mean, the, the, the timelines for the studios are just so, bogged down too that I mean it is it is incredible that we pulled it off in two and a half months, but we structured it in a really, really smart way too, because we knew we had a tight timeline so we weren't making inventory. We were doing a pre sale trunk show model only that's important, at least for the specificity of what I did. Um, that's how we brought the economics of the promotion down, we had no inventory to create um, only samples and. Um, and. So when we met with the Disney team, there were a lot of blinking stares at us <laughs> about how how could you possibly get these things done? Um, we can't get these things done on that timeline. And we said, it's our collaborators. It's our relationship. It's my relationship and Linda's relationship with these collaborators who we know how they work. They trust us and their owner, for the most part, we chose owner, um, still founder owned companies. So we weren't locked into a big conglomerate company. We were locked into the owner and the owner can make one decision and pivot pivot production for us, which was key. But could Disney have activated those kinds of collaborations? Could they have brought that kind of value to a fast moving train? I was the faster one. I was the faster moving train you know, in the situation because I knew exactly which collaborators could pull this off. Um, but you have to vocalize that. You have to explain that that's part of what you're pitching. And, and that's what was part of the reason why they, they went with, not part, it was the reason they went. They were like, you can pull this off in two and a half, three months, Disney can't, let's go, you know, so. Very cool, thank you guys very much. I'm gonna move to the next question is for Frank. Um, costume designer Cobra Kai consistently gets a great deal of attention and seems to be a main character on the show itself. Um, I'm personally a fan, and I just recently worked with one of your lead actors, Sholo, on Blue Beetle. Uh, the, um, great. Yeah, so very fun there. Um, Champion Brand has had a collaboration with the show. Can you explain your role in this? 
Sure. I mean, I, this was presented to me by Sony Marketing. They came to me directly with, they had this integration contract uh, put in place with Champion and they wanted to put Champion on, on the show in a custom manner. And they presented me with this big deck of just like a, everything in the kitchen sink. They just slapped the logo on a bunch of their existing designs uh, and it, w- it didn't make any sense. It didn't, it didn't work on the show. And uh, to integrate that stuff into my show, I said, I, I basically, I saw the opportunity. I said, like, look, let me pitch this idea. I will take these designs with all work with Champion directly um, that Sony Marketing set up this relationship, um, work with them directly to create a, actually a cohesive collection that would work on the show as part of that would become like part of the, the, the Cobra Kai Dojo, their new, their new sportswear looks. And um, I basically pitched for me to design this whole collaboration with them because what they were presenting to me didn't make sense. I said, if you want me to put this, these, these designs on the show, it's going to be a very small thing, but we can make this a really big thing. We're going to really, really highlight this integration. Um, they love the idea again, like to, to the point of, of like marketing, like JW said, marketing doesn't know what we do necessarily or how fast we do it or, or, or really they don't grasp what, what our, our skill set is and what we bring to it. Um, and so I, because of that setup, they, they agreed to that. And then they said, like, I told them that this is outside the scope of my job as a costume designer, right? It's like, I could design this stuff and not use champion, um, uh, and do kind of a similar thing, but it wouldn't be the branding thing, it would be the integration. But if you want to present this integration with me, that's great. I can get value added to my show because of their because of their their manufacturing capabilities and what they can, their sublimation, all that other fun stuff that I got to do. Um, but this needed that they needed to recognize this outside my scope as the artist for hire on the show, because I'm now working with marketing and a, a sportswear brand to do a collaborative design for the show. And um and so the, to Deirdre's point of like con, reading contracts and paying attention to, to the notes and all that stuff, I had some help with Linda as well on this. Um, she gave me the, the great tip of like, get, ask them for a red line contract, right? So when they send it to you, it isn't necessarily that's not the final offer. You can negotiate like anything else. And uh, you can come back with your deal points. And I said like, I'm happy to do this for, for the show, but you don't get to own it forever. You don't get to then market this. Or if you want to, I would love to see these products made and they never did get made for the mass, for the mass market. They remained for use on the show because that was the, that was the deal that I insisted on. Like you can use these for the show only. Um, we use them on two different seasons, but, but the specifically for that season four um, that it worked for that. But if they wanted to market them for something else, that's a renegotiation. And I would love to, and just to, to, to recognize the value that I brought to that, the design work that I did or that we do on these things, that if it's, if you're saying you want to use it for one thing and then you want to do it for something else, awesome, let's do it. But it's like, that's a renegotiation point, right? And Correct. that was like, and I think, and I think that they ended up not producing the line because it became this, I think it probably became too unwieldy for them to figure out how to do it, right? Because there's a lot of marketing, there's a lot of like, a lot of merch that that Cobra Kai does through third parties and through their own official store. But I think that they marketing didn't know how to do that and how to work with Sony legal and all that other stuff to make it happen. Um, so it was, it, it, for me, it was a re- recognizing an opportunity um, and recognizing my worth and what I could bring to it to make this, you know, if, if like, integrations happen all the time very very seldom do we get an opportunity to actually design the integration or do the collaboration uh for works in the show and you know presenting it may not work every time but presenting the opportunity presenting the opportunity of of the value that we bring to this right like I, what i brought the value i brought to this collaboration was like i can make this fit into the show i can make this fit into our the world of the show and not just throw some you know this the latest nike on there or the latest you know vans or what have you it's like i can make this if you let me design this for the show it will be part of the show and the, that that would be the value brought to this and then and recognizing that 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 value has could have legs make sure that i'm protected in that that was uh that's the long and short of it, really. <laughs> That's is there anything that you feel like now, having gone through it, that you might change or do differently or try to set up for the future if you're approached to do it again? I think that I would have, I mean, I'm always very friendly with the PR people. I don't reach out necessarily directly to the marketing people. I'm 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 always 
happy to participate and help out with them and become friendly with them. I think that I would have gone a little deeper with that and, and advocated for the, to have this product line done. I would probably could have fought for that a little harder, but then again, we're also doing the rest of our job, you know, and, and, Correct. and this is, this is all on top of everything else as like meetings and production schedules and, and, you know, stunt players and blah, blah, blah. So it's like at, at one, at some point you, I have to focus on my job as a designer because I'm not, you know, a co but it's finding that place and the time and, and the people. That's probably what I would have done differently. I might have like fought a little bit harder to have it made because I would love to see it out there, regardless of like, regardless of the financial. I wasn't even looking for like a big, I wasn't like demanding on, I need 10, 10 cents on the dollar or 10% of gross, whatever. I just wanted something, an honorific. I wanted something to recognize that this is, you know, I wanted credit. I wanted a little bit of a financial uh, compensation because they're making a lot of money off of it. So off of my designs and blah, blah, blah. Um, I think that it probably could have something else could have happened had I had the time and wasn't in production to to make it a bigger thing. That split focus thing has been really difficult. I know for a lot of my designer friends in terms of just being able to like do your job, but then also do the other side of it. Because the yeah. part that's hardest is, is that they happen at the same time. They're literally exactly. doing your job. There's a whole marketing team working and it's really hard to split focus and do both. Um, yeah. Do you have do you have in the new season, do you have more collaborations coming? I don't have anything officially in line yet. I mean, I I would love again. It comes down to the time thing and the authority is like 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 JW is saying like who owns the IP. Like I know that my showrunners own the IP, but then it's also held by Sony. It's also held by Netflix. Everybody has their hands in the pot and to some degree. So I would love to approach other sportswear brands and and I like you know it's a Southern California set show. So like I use a lot of like. Um, like you know california brands that i would love to approach and say hey let's do let's do an integration let's do something else that that you know for our final season that's going to be big and amazing um but there i don't have the authority you know and i don't have the time necessarily to to hunt that down so yeah at this point i don't have a big collab yet that's a hard one i think linda can you speak to a little bit in terms of like the fact, like maybe it kind of like, is there a structure that designers can put in place, at least in terms of the very beginning, at least trying to, if they've got the support to maybe almost have like two teams going or like, how does that work? No, I, you know, it, it's, it's hard to answer that because, you know, Frank and I have talked briefly, but, um, you know, if you really believe there's something there and in many shows there, there, is the opportunity to do something with the show or inspired by the work of the show. Or, you know, I was talking to, to Amy Paris, who I think is on here. You know, she did Yellow Jackets this past season and Stranger mm -hmm. Things, you know, for many seasons. It's kind of like she is an influencer in that market space that has value to brands. I mean, Frank potentially could be as well with his work on Cobra Kai and going to some of those LA brands as the costume designer of Cobra Kai and kind of sidestepping or, or creating value for the brand separate from your role as a costume designer. Um, but, it, but again, to reiterate everything, what Frank was just saying, it, it's a lot of work. Um, and you, you know, the most important thing to all of you is to maintain your role as costume designers and the integrity of your work and have the time to do that right. So no one else can really do it without you. I mean, I or someone like me could support you in that effort and kind of make some initial calls and bring some brands to you. And oftentimes it's bringing the brands and the program to the network and studio. And that way they sort of have to involve you because um, you know, you're know you the one who's already got the relationship with the brand. I mean, Salvador, I don't know if you wanna talk about the guilt program, but we did something inspired by his work as a costume designer in creating coats. And ultimately Hulu wanted to be involved in it and allowed the use of the assets for free because it was done at a time that benefited promotion of the new season. So the brand got Salvador's design work and ultimately the product, the coats were integrated into the new season of the Mindy project and Hulu benefited because there were all those eyeballs on guilt.com to you know, watch the new season of the Mindy project. So there's so many different ways um, 
you know, I, I can't say there's one standard way of doing it, but if you really believe there's something there for you or your show, you know, you should really work to make it happen if you're willing to put that time in and have that time. I mean, JR was fortunate in that she had some time in between films to really focus on a lot of this too. And that was one of the points that we should bring up is that um, I designed my coat collection and it was a Salvador Perez collection and had nothing to do with Midi Project and the Bobble Bar collection on my summer off because I didn't want there to be, and I made sure I cataloged all of that, that I was not under payroll for the show when I was designing these products. So they were my collections. Ironically, they used them both on the shows. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I think that's to the point where all of us is like, we're all, we keep talking about marketing a show, marketing a show. What Linda has taught me is that I, as a costume designer with the notoriety, the small notoriety I get has value. And that's what I'm looking at this at. It's like, we shouldn't always be worried about being tied to a show because if a brand wants to hire us and Linda has proven this many times before, I'm, I've gotten paid to do things that have nothing to do with the show because of who I am. And I think that that's a very important asset for us because look, we are never going to become millionaires working for as costume designers. But if a brand sees our value and wants to take us into a merchandising or a fashion brand, that's where the future of this is because the studios are always going to have the power, but we have the power of our designs and our notoriety. They look at you guys a lot too, like from the outside in. Costume designers not only are influencers, but you guys are highly collectible, meaning that people want to know about you yourself, not like just as a brand, but like as, as you as a brand as yourself. So like with someone like Frank, right, Cobra Kai is so collectible as a show, right? It's got a nostalgic factor, but then also the clothes are really prominent. Like it's something that people look at. So, you know, I have a 12 year old, so she's into Stranger Things and all of those things, right? She wants to, you know, consume that stuff. So that's stuff that like, if you're able to attach your name to it, then people start to know like, oh, this is Frank or, oh, this is Amy or, oh, this is Janetta, right? Like, it's like, they know who it is and then they go for that. And I think the studio is starting to actually understand that or there people are starting to see that. I think it's because of the age of social media, everyone's much more visible. So now you can mm -hmm. go directly to the source and you can see that person that designs that thing that you love and then you focus on them as much as you focus on the show or anything else. So I think it's a good point to have to know that that is there. I mean, they're just trying to figure out how to like basically capitalize off of it while that thing is there, you know, uh, in the public eye. Um, I'm gonna move to Janetta now. I talk to you about the fact that you work on one of the most popular highest rated shows on TV, Yellowstone. Um, and more and more attention is being given to its costume design and impact on runways, brand collections, pop culture, et cetera. Um, there's a few things that we can talk about here, but I think Paramount has a few collections with Wrangler and Walmart that you were not involved in directly. Do you can you speak to that for us and tell us? Yes. Like, what about? Thanks, Philip. And yeah. uh, thank you guys for this amazing panel discussion. It's absolutely incredible. I do want to just in when I get involved with this whole conversation, just to share how important it was for Linda Kearns of Matchbook to be a part of everything from the beginning, from the very beginning, because there's language in the negotiating of the contract and there's information that she has from her decades of experience that we're just not privy to, in addition to the relationships with the studios and the networks as well. The, uh, it, was, it was surprising you know, to most to see that I actually wasn't involved at all in the collaborations that Yellowstone has with both Walmart and uh, and and just the other collaborations that they have in general initially. the and and going back to what um, JR was saying, as well as going back to what Tracy Gigi was saying or just what everyone uh, probably knows and says as well as Frank and this, this. They simply don't know what it is that we do. They don't understand it. We have this huge campaign naked without us, but they don't even understand what that means. <laughs> you know, Deirdre, uh, Deirdre was also saying that as well. They don't know who we are and they don't, which means that if they don't know who we are, they don't understand the value. So initially I had multiple conversations with the studio exec with regards to product and branding and the marketing of Yellowstone iconic wear. Well, I shared with them, I said, here's the bottom line. There are people who are making Yellowstone product in their garage with their own silk screen machines every weekend and selling it across all platforms, eBay, Etsy, 
at their yard sales, at the flea markets, what have you. And he said, oh yeah, I think I did notice some of that's going on. So he went to send out a cease and desist letter. Well, you can't reach everyone. People are in nooks and crannies all over the country. You'll never be able to tap into that, which I shared with him as well. So they went forward and he said, well, we already are in conversation with Walmart. And I said, well, that's really great. However, Walmart truly isn't the customer of the products used on Yellowstone. That's, that's great that you're doing that. However, Rips Jacket is still thin. Your Walmart client is not a Filson purchaser. The jackets are, you know, upwards of $300. So he said, yes, I know, but that's already a motion. I said, well, then that's fantastic. Well, then do what you can do there. And they did. Right. They also went off and did a collab with Wrangler. That's a collab. And I think that people really don't understand in a lot of cases what that actually means, collab. And Linda can speak to that as well because it's a very fine line and it needs some clarity. Not everyone is presenting a collaboration. What they're asking you is to use your product on your show, but not something that you have a hand in creating or designing. They're asking you, which Frank just mentioned, they want you to use it so that they can give visibility on your cast, but you get nothing from it, right? Whether it's monetary or recognition or anything, it's not a true collaboration. Collaborations to me are defined as when I'm truly a part of the, um, the creation of that, whatever it is, whether it's a recipe or clothing or accessories or what have you. So with the um, agreements and the relationship between Yellowstone and Walmart and Wrangler, Wrangler designed Yellowstone, they asked for permission to put the branding on the garments and that's how that um, was birthed. I had nothing to do with any of it. They did come back and say, hey, we'd love to, quote you with some with some of your uh, input, put some of your uh, some of your integration into the launch of the line, just so that we can make sure that the customer understands that you are a part. Well, yes and no, because <laughs> because I wasn't a part. And thank you for the opportunity. Sure. So then we move forward. And now we are, then we shift because they realize what that actually meant because the market is now oversaturated with Yellowstone product. Mm -hmm. But is it really a true and a wise marketing tool? Because it's a television show. It's not as branded clothing with Nike and, and or even Wrangler itself. It's a television show that's being branded within the entity of a clothing manufacturer. So now they're relooking at all of it, which will probably segue Philip into your next question. Yes, which would be your integrated. <laughs> you're very much so involved in this new program called Shop the Scenes, which is its own entity running through Shoppable TV. Um, and then, can you share with the group about this new concept that's basically bringing the look of the show, costume props, set decoration, home decor directly to viewers and fans? It's just a really exciting idea. So please to share with us about this. Sure. That is an exciting idea. And it is, I would say, uh, definitely a true collaboration because the studio had to come to me. They had to come to me for the costumes that are being used on the show. It's the relationship that I have with brands and also the relationship just built off of Yellowstone in and of itself that, uh, that I have with the cast and with the brand's uh, visibility. So the studio comes to me and they ask, and they, and, they, and they introduced this concept. Of course, Jill Martin is incredible. She's hosted uh, QVC shows for decades. So she's a very, she's a personality that has a broad audience. It's a wise, it's a fantastic business venture for them to get integrated with her because she now reaches an audience that we'll never reach. Yellowstone will reach that audience, but as a, as a marketing viewer offering a product from a design perspective, we won't reach that audience, right? So they birthed this whole conceptual idea of shoppable TV, which was fantastic and is fantastic. I'm sure this is the launch of it. This is just the beginning of what's going to happen. It came at a time during COVID that everyone is glued to their television and no one's going to the store. Ta-da, right? Genius. You scan a QR code, it takes you to the product. Everyone loves what... Um, what notably a couple well, of cast members are wearing. Just wanted to pause for that moment. Yes. So <laughs> they, uh, 
so that was genius uh, uh, on their part. They, they, Beth and Rip are the two people that everyone wants to know where to get their pieces. You can't get everything that they're wearing. No, some of it's vintage. A lot of it's, a lot of it's vintage actually. Some of it, and we shoot a year in advance. So how can you possibly get product a year later? And with COVID happening, we shot a year, we took off a year, and then it aired the next year. So now we're two years behind. What we did was, I, I, uh, Linda and myself, we contacted the vendors and 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 had a conversation with them and was shoppable with Jill and the team. And the team in the beginning was two people and myself. So that's a very small, when you get in at the very beginning, you have a little bit more power than you do when you get in with something that's already growing, where you have a group of people that don't understand what it is that you do. When you only have two people that don't understand, you're able to define who you are more um, more cohesively in a way that they understand and are also willing to engage with you, support you. So we went to the vendors and said, okay, while this isn't available, let's do what's available that's similar to it. That's a win-win for them as well. Now they've created this whole marketing place, this entity that makes everything available to the viewing audience, regardless of where you are. Yellowstone just hit Brazil. It doesn't matter what country you're in because everyone ships worldwide. It's it's an incredible launch of a concept that is only growing from here to infinity. There are no limits. Of course, money is a limit. But <laughs> outside of that, there's no limits. They did it as a um, as a consignment piece. So they're not buying tangible merchandise in some cases, in some cases they are. In others, they're just connecting you to the vendor so you can get that product. Then in addition to that, we are in conversations about how oh, I can design pieces in the true collaboration with a manufacturer. Linda is pivotal. I mean, she is the crucial element in all of this working because without her, her knowledge and her understanding, it's impossible to do. Even in your contracts, going back to what Deirdre was saying, in your contracts, you negotiating and what Salvador was saying, we are work for hire. They're never gonna give that back to us. But right. if you yourself are designing outside of the project that you're doing, that's where you have longevity. That's where you have power. That's where you have focus as well, because your the audience is connected to what you bring to the project. That's why they love the designs, because without us, people are naked. They love what we're bringing to the cast and how we put it together. So, however, the studio owns all of it, every last piece of it. So when Salvador was working off his, on his own, he was on his own dollar. Because otherwise, if you're not on your own dollar and the studio puts any money towards it, then they again own it again. Yeah, it so again. when Linda's looking at the contract, she's noticing, and an attorney, everyone needs an attorney. We all need attorneys. Because if that sentence, when my contract came, my GMO says I'm a costume designer. That's all it says. Yeah. And it says my IP, the intellectual property, own, is owned by the studio. I'm work for hire, right? So everything that I create is done for them. We tweak the my agent who handles my negotiations for shows. She only does that. He doesn't know how to read the contract outside of that. Linda came into my into my life via Salvador because I called Salvador and said, I've got this, something is about to happen. I don't really know what it is exactly, but these are the conversations about it. He said, call Linda now. I literally hung up from him, called Linda. That's where it all began. Linda looked and my attorney looked and he said, wait, I don't like the way this one sentence sounds. The way the wording is placed says that you have no rights to anything. We have to change the words in this sentence and how they're structured. And I said, okay, are they gonna let us do that? And he said, probably they'll say no, but we're gonna push forward until they say yes. And we did. Deirdre held it out. She held out until her contract came back null and void. I mean, they didn't, they didn't um, approve any of her changes. Yeah. But we have to start in small places so we can make big strides. You start with one word in the sentence and the organization of that sentence and how that word is structured. When we get that, then we can move on to the next. 
So with this, um, with this shoppable TV, we started, it's growing. We said, Linda said it's for one season, only for season five. Well, we did for season four and five because season four was ending. When we go to the next season, it's a whole new negotiation. It's a whole new contract, but at least the contract and the way that it, that it is set up right now has some room for growth. We can't, Rome wasn't built in a day, so we can't change it all in one day, but we can do it little by little. And most importantly, when people are paying attention outside of ourselves, because I don't know about you guys, but I use my right and left side of the brain. I am a creative. I do look from a business perspective, but there are people who are um, experts at what they do, like yeah. my attorney and Linda, who all they do is look at these numbers and these and this information on a page all day long mm -hmm. and look for the opportunities where we can be successful. And that's where you have to make sure you have those things in, uh, in place for our support. It's pretty much having, like, if you think about Linda, like, so I've had been blessed to have worked with her. It's like having a, like, a very knowledgeable, functional buffer, right? So it's like, yes. and also in the, in the, filling in the blanks of instances that you don't know, or where you might use the other side, the creative side of your brain, when you should be using the business side of your brain. It's having someone that's focused on that the entire time. And it does create a buffer. It's similar to like, when you have to go and negotiate, you don't want to be the one necessarily negotiating. You want your manager to go do all the business stuff and then you just get to show up and be creative, right? It's that same thing, but on a marketing side. That's absolutely 1000% correct. Yeah. When they are interacting with Linda, it's nothing personal towards me. It's a business conversation. It's mm -hmm. a business relationship. Linda is presenting it from that perspective and they listen to her differently than they listen to creatives. Oh, correct. I mean, that's just the truth about it all. They look at us as creatives they the our value to them and the project is limited based on the fact that we are creatives. But when you're sitting down at the table with business entities and business relationships, they all sit at the table with a different posture, with a different approach to the context on the contract and with a different outcome. And that's that's just the way business is done. And everyone says in the business world, it's just business, it's not personal. And that's Correct. truly what it is. Something that she just said too reminds me of the fact that like it is that if you when you you'll find and I don't know if any of the other creatives have figured that or found this the same. Um, if you try to kind of step into marketing without knowing what you're doing, you'll also get kind of a hostile kind of feeling back, which is because marketing is so separate. They all have their own thoughts and kind of like elevations for like where they want to go to. Right. So you've got like a young marketing exec that has this whole idea. They've been given the product. And now they have this whole idea about their vision of where they want it to go. You don't fit into that at all. Like you're like a non kind of like a visual you like you did your job. It got passed to them and now they're carrying it forward. So you stepping into it sometimes can be a little bit threatening, at least in terms of them thinking like uh, like if it's not framed in the way of collaboration. Right. But it's that business side again. So I think that that's something that you have to know and separate the two and then have someone like Linda come in that basically is like, this is what it is. This is what the money is. This is like, it's just very cut and dry. Um, and it's, it's smart to do so. So thank you for highlighting that. Yes. In addition to that, and thank you for Philip for bringing that up. And Deidre mm -hmm. has her, um, Deidre has her hand up. I just noticed that. So in addition to that, it, here's the, here's the thing. Marketing is a business entity. So when we interject or or if we introduce ourselves into that world and that conversation, it gets it can sometimes get very murky, right? Mm -hmm. And and it disempowers us in a way because there because the level of understanding and communication is different. Everyone says can say the same thing. But based on the tone, based on the context, based on the timing, and based on the person's relationship to that information that's being shared, the hearing is different. It's always the same with everyone. So with Linda, it's great because Linda, not only share from a marketing perspective, but she also comes with a considerable amount of options. Mm -hmm. She comes with, well, if we don't do it this way, how about let's look at it, approaching it from this direction, or I can also offer you this. And on most of what Linda brings to the table, I honestly have never even thought of, 
Mm-hmm. And, and it's, again, it's because of her approach and her marketing background that allows her to see with a whole different paradigm and a completely different distinction to what it is that the approach is, what they're looking for and what we're looking for. Yeah. A lot of times, especially in our, in our, in our favor, right? We, we are, we're not working for free. So the, the designer that Linda mentioned goes, that goes to dress windows and, um, and, or mannequins. And the marketing team didn't realize that that was out of her scope of work because she's a costume designer. They'll loop everything in if Mm -hmm. they could. I, I mean, everything. So, and there's nothing wrong with us going to do that because they are still our designs. Yeah. They they are. So if we want them represented properly and within the scope of what we're doing for whatever project we're working on, it's to your best interest to go dress those windows so that it represents you and what you're doing on the show if you have time. And if you don't have time, perhaps you can have your ACD or someone do it. And then I also wanted to mention um, something else, which you may be getting to, Philip. So if I mm-hmm. if I've jumped the gun, um, no, I apologize. Please. And it's this. This it's it's hard work. I think Salvador, I think everyone who's who's spoken has mentioned how hard it is. It's hard work. This all for me takes place while I'm working. So I, while we're shooting in the middle of, like Frank said, stunts going on, photo doubles, two units going at the same time. You've got no cell service because we're in a remote environment. I still have to produce the content that goes to shoppable. The clothing now, it's it's a zoom zoom. It's on a timely fashion because we're behind again. So it all has to be done. Season five, part one aired. Now we're going to season five, part two, but there's still people who are catching up. So I have to, on the moment, moment in time, now they're asking me, can you please send what the cast is wearing today? Mm-hmm. And can you send it from the fitting pictures? I said, well, that takes probably three people because I myself, I'm in the middle of the show. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to sit down and I work a 16 hour day. I don't have time to sit down and do that. And it still has to be done, right? So there's figuring that whole component out as well. That's me. And let me say, I don't want to go to Deidre. Or Deirdre, sorry. I just want to, uh, there are a couple of things that Janetta has shared and also Linda, but the one thing that I noticed when the dynamic changed, when I stepped in with Amazon is that I had a very clear understanding of marketing language and how to speak to what I was asking for. Mm-hmm. And the, I cannot extra, express the importance of really coming out because I, I know as designers, some of us are very inner and we don't like to be in front of the camera. I, for one, don't like it. Um, I need to do better on social media. But when I came through the door and I had a lot of the clear information and I did a lot of the thinking for them, they were very open. Actually, on two parts, uh, Linda was on the call um, very early on for season two of Harlem for me, and they completely were open and very supportive in terms of how they wanted to activate and champion. Um, For my next project, that was the one where I had to step in the room on the gallery um, shoot and say, hey, when I was able to articulate the value and the importance and then the whole thread of costumes to the beginning to the end, it's literally you're talking the language of business and money. And that literally negates the emotion that we have as we're connected to our work. So there is a part of detachment that I feel you have to um, move with. But I do find when you are highly informed, know the language, know how to speak to it. And then you have a partner like Linda with you. I feel it's more effective. Um, And I'll just say that. So thank you. And then Linda, did you have something? I did. Um, Well, I appreciate all the compliments. I just want to point out to everyone that, you know, there's probably as many times where I'm not as successful in actually getting the money for the costume designers that they deserve or, Um, getting as much money as we believe is really, you know, um, fair. But at the same time, you know, there have been cases where I've gone back to a particular costume designer and said, look, they they heard me, they recognize you should be involved. 
Um, maybe in the future they'll consider it. Um, do you want to do this or not? Is it something you still want to participate in for the credit and the visibility and the social media bump you might get by, from participating and doing a content creation with a brand that has 2 million Instagram followers? So I think, you know, you know, I thank you, Janetta. I appreciate, you know, um, you know, clearly um, we've, we've done some good things, but there's a lot of obstacles still out there and it's, it's hard work to make these things happen too. And there's so many misconceptions in the, the, the world, you know, the world that you're operating in about what you can do, who you are, what you bring to the party and what that's worth and what they're able to pay you. And you have to find the right party to pay you. Like JR was saying, it was the promotions department actually that ended up paying for some of the, the value because it was from a promotional perspective. Disney wants to make the money in the licensing. You know, they didn't have to pay JR or I to create that collaboration. And then just quickly going back, because I know we're, we're limited on time, um, to the shop the scenes thing. Um, you know, over the last decade, so many people have tried to monetize this shop the show thing. It's not easy to do. And shop the scenes came to it with a lot of misconceptions. I mean, they thought they didn't think that, well, some of this product wouldn't be available anymore. They thought JR would just have the names of all the people at the brands that she bought from. They didn't realize that she shopped so much vintage. I mean, it's so sort of make these things happen, even for the shop, the look and, um, you know, getting kind of fairly compensated and involved and in making that successful. There's still a lot to be done in that area. I mean, I'd say there's probably been 20 or 30 companies that have gone out of business trying to monetize shop the show through QR codes, through data, through just website information. But shop the scenes has been positioned to do it. But at the same time, they've sort of switched to merch a lot because they haven't been able to successfully get, you know, even with our help, Janetta, to get all the product that they could. So a um, lot, lot of progress still to make. <laughs> thank you guys so much. Thank you, Janetta. Thank you, Linda, and everybody that spoke. Thank you guys. Um, I'm gonna move to Denise next. Um, so Denise, I see that the free people, uh, free people, Daisy Jones and the Sixth Collection is currently for sale on their site. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came about and what your role was? Yeah, first of all, I am. I, it is so interesting to hear everybody's individual experiences because everybody is so different, and it's interesting to see a, a television show that's been on for a couple series, and you're able to go into it with a different perspective, knowing what you want and being able to pitch it. Um, I started in the fashion business, so I have absolutely no interest in going back to that realm. I know how time consuming it is. And um, quite frankly, on this show, I just wanted to finish the show. I didn't want to be involved in anything that was being done. Uh, I, as a rule, never use product placement. I don't, I don't like feeling obligated. I don't like trying. I mean, it's amazing what Frank was able to do because usually you just have to stick some product in that has nothing to do with your look. Um, Amazon came to me and asked me if I wanted to use free people. And I actually liked the brand a lot. And I had already been buying some vintage pieces from them because it felt like it had the right vibe for the show. And at a certain point, I realized that I was work for hire. That was in my contract. I'd already been on the show. I didn't really want to be involved. So I didn't want to go back and renegotiate my contract. So I, I kind of took the attitude of you can't beat them, join them. I became so close with the marketing people, with publicity, with free people who I loved. They were amazing. They put me on their website. They tagged me with everything. They, they shouted me out all over. They did an interview with me. And the same with Amazon. Because of my relationship with them, I have my own publicity team. I have my own marketing team. I have my own awards team. I have everybody. They, they involved me in all the gallery shoots. What I didn't gain in monetary compensation, I gained with credibility and publicity and marketing. And now when I go back, I mean, if there was a second season, I would go back to Amazon and, and do what Deirdre did and, and, and have Linda renegotiate the wording to at least say, I have the option of 
being involved. I think Amazon now knows what that collaboration between the two of them, they are making so much money. But again, Free People sent me a ton of stuff. They sent me the collection. They, they've been so gracious and so uh, inclusive. And sometimes it's just about being acknowledged and that to me sometimes means a little more and being credited. And I wasn't involved in some crappy line and which has been done before where they're just going to make something and it's just not what you would do. And so I felt very, it was a different situation for me, but I would go back to Amazon and say, this is what I can do. This is what I can offer you. This is, and, and I think I have that relationship now with any brand I go to, if I was doing a show, if I chose to do that. But like everyone said, it is extremely time consuming. And I just don't know if I have the, the bandwidth to work on that because they were working on that, that collection while I was shooting. Correct. It was a nightmare. You know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had the time. It would have been awful. Is there anything like, what are your key learnings from this, from that program or doing and going through that process? I, I would do it differently. I would like everyone saying like, this is the wild west. I would go in like Deirdre did and, 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 and change my contract going in to at least give me the option of doing something if I chose to. Yeah. That's a, that's a key caveat to this, because I think that a lot of the times um, between the hard work and then trying to do your actual job. And then Janetta was talking about like, there are yeah. texts her in the middle of her doing fittings and all this other stuff. And she's just like, what? Like it's too, it's I very- I don't know how she's doing it. God bless her. <laughs> We've known each other a really long time, you know, and Deirdre too. It's like, it, but everybody has different experiences. And that's why I think this is a really good format for everyone to, to talk about their experiences and what they've done and how they've been able to achieve. But it's about what you want to do for yourself. And, you know, I'm getting better. I'm not great at social media but I'm getting better at it. And, and, you know, like Tracy said, it's part of our job. We have to do it. And it, again, it's time consuming. It's a time suck. Yeah, completely. Um, I did the, see, I thought, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, just quickly, thought, I just wanted yeah. to mention, Denise, the, the, here's the thing. We never know what show, whether it's the studio or the marketing team, we never know who's going to reach out and say, this is what we'd like for you to do just like with JR, you don't know. So what you want to do more than anything is be ready, be prepared, prepare yourself for the opportunity when it presents itself, because we're not, we're, these waters are being navigated and captained by someone else in the helm, right? And then they come to us and say, just like with Denise, they come to, they came to her and said, how about this? They came to, to JR and said, how about this? They came to Frank and said, how about this? Deirdre, Deirdre knew what the options were and what the availability was. They came to JR. So you never know when someone's going to walk into your office and say, hi there, nice to meet you. I am thus and such. And this is what we have in mind. Because once they do, you're either, like Denise said, you're either, you know, you work for hire. So you're either going to jump on the bandwagon or you're not. And if you don't, then what you're going to see is a whole plethora of merchandise out there without you having any input at all. And it, it's just like back in the day, before a little farther back in time, people, they didn't hire the costume designer to do the gallery shoots. They hired a stylist, a stylist team that came in from LA or New York, and they did the styling for all the promotional advertising for the shows. And then you looked up and then suddenly you saw a poster or a billboard and you're saying, wait, those aren't even close from the show. That's not even what the character looks like. <laughs> now, at least they're coming to the costume designers in some cases, not all, because I understand what Deirdre is talking about because, because the ad team, the marketing team, the gallery shoot team is a completely different agency. So if you don't connect, if you don't have that listed in your deal memo that you're present for the gallery shoots, they're going to hire somebody else to do it. And you're going to look up, you can't even use you can't even use the poster or the photograph for your project because someone else styled it. Yeah. Then what do you do? You look at it and you say, wait, I can't even use this PR on my social media or anything else because I didn't even do that work. Nor does it represent anything that I would have ever done because they're not connected to it. Yeah. Right? So you do yourself a favor and your due diligence to get your head in the game that this could one day knock on your door. Then you have to open the door and choose how you're gonna respond. 
Thank you. I, and I, I think you're right. And I could have said no. I could have said no. I don't want to use them. It's not. It's not what I want to do. Which is what I usually do. But right. I really decided to kind of embrace the whole thing and just say, yes. okay, I'm just going to go, and I'm just going to to make the best of it because I knew they were going to do it anyway. Yes. And, you know, at the end of the day, at least I got some press from it. Great. Yeah. I'm going to open it up really quick to questions I got are up here. Um, I've got Frank, JR, and then Deirdre, and then we're going to do a Q&A. So that Frank. Oh, Frank, you're muted. Really quickly, I just wanted to say that I want to, like to what Janetta was saying, like be prepared for when these options or opportunities come to you or, or seek them out if you want them. But also one thing that I really am delighted by is that we're all here sharing our things, talking about we're all, call me, call any one of us. I, I mean, I want to speak for anybody else, but we are all here to help out. If you, if someone comes to you as like something is similar or different, you know, whether it's Linda or just you want to call one of one of us, you know, I am, I'm certainly here and I love that we are all here talking and sharing. This is is incredible because it is like it is how I want to see our guild and our work and our world work and I think it's fantastic I just wanted to give props and also make myself available if anybody ever has any questions that I might have any remote help on Thank and you. he means it because I called him too <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much JR I'll second that I mean I spoke to I see Ellen's on here too Ellen Ariane Janie Sal Antoinette, I think every single one of you guys, because I would never have been successful. So um, call me, I'm on that list too. Uh, I just wanted to say that this has been so wonderful to listen to and it's reinforced, like my biggest learning curve on this was to walk away and go, okay, you know, there are two things once we create our our, our designs for, for a business, the studio, there are really only two things the studios are in business to do with us. They are in business to then at that point promote their product or the studios do not want to be in fashion. They're not a fashion company. That's not their business. Their business is to license and or promote their assets. And the issue right now, I, I hope, and I'm gonna put it out there, I hope one day because we're proving it here that we are now identified as one of those assets, right? We're not clearly identified and integrated into the studio system as a business model asset yet. Um, but, you know, when we hopefully keep proving these things, that's also why the credit the costume designer campaign is really important to this also, is, you know, hopefully the only way to play on their level is to, you know, make them see that we're, we're the, we are an asset and you can maybe when you get the door, you know, that someone knocks on your door for this. Um, so my husband's eye watch is going off if you can hear that, sorry. But, you know, but, you know, when they come to you there, what my, what I learned was, you know, sometimes you're gonna be able to scale up big and do something big and you wanna take that on. And sometimes you want to scale it down and maybe just be involved in the licensing. You know, they they sell, they just sell these licenses out like that. They dole them out because that's their business model is to sell off these licenses. Perhaps one day they'll learn that we can be a premium to those license sales. And yeah, you're not going to make a ton of money, but, you know, getting a thousand five hundred to whatever the number makes sense, getting that thrown your way just to be a premium access to the brand while they're licensing out their cards, hopefully one day they'll recognize that as like a bare minimum level, right? Then you can also get into doing these other things like promotions that are bigger scope, bigger scale, and you can decide if you would want to take that on at that time. But really it's those two levels that we, it's, are, are we going to align with the studios in what they do in promotions or are we going to align with them in what we do when they license? But you know, we're value in both ways. And I do hope that one day we get more integrated. Till then, it's the wild, wild west. But Thank you, JR. Thank you. And Deirdre? Um, just one last point on um, contract and uh, making sure that language is there. There was a situation I had a few years back where I had the language in there to style all the promo shoots, anything that pertained to the show. That was violated. They did bring in a stylist. And it spoke nothing to those characters that I had created. Working with these people again, 
they learned their lesson by what happened the first time because it was a cautionary tale. And so what I can say is where it could have become an aggressive exchange really became an understanding of the importance of having the costume designer style the gallery shoots if they want to. Um, and this last effort that I worked on, I did so much upfront work that they even re-rated me. They paid me more because they said what I brought the value, the understanding of the content. I even asked for their concepts. Every marketing team has a concept of how they're going to promote your show, your series, or, or your film. So I asked for that information and just that alone, that language of asking for it, they were willing to share it and say, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. I did the yeah. same thing for my show at South by Southwest. I was a part of that effort and telling them, hey, this is the costume that you need to use. It's a 13 foot tall puppet. No, you can't use the crushed velvet. You need to use this. Yeah. So those kinds of conversations I just want to share, you know, it's just important to you as the last comment to get in the game, get your head in the game. Thanks guys. Thank you. And then Anna. So I just want to circle back and say um, thank you to everyone who's weighed in. Um, but to the audience as well, you know, of course, everyone on this panel is a resource, but we, your union is a resource. Brigida, I, Terry, Sal, but, you know, we are here for you. We are here for your calls. I advocate for members every day for your articles to be properly credited, your social media posts. We discuss all of these sorts of things. And if you want to just have an easy conversation, we're here for you 100%. So just reach out. We look forward to it. Thank you, Anna. I also wanted to, I see Karasan in the audience and she had had a question before, but she also is the costume designer for Disney Descendants. Can you speak about that since you're here? Yes, I just wanted to share this. I think it may be helpful. Um, I was a costume designer for Disney Descendants um, 1, 2, and 3. And when I had a little different experience with Disney, because when they first started, they had never done a franchise like this. And I know we're talking a lot about marketing, but another department that is very helpful to the costume designers is really brand, um, the brand development and franchise and merchandising. So Disney Consumer Products came to me um, months before we we're about to go in production and said, hey, we've never done anything like this. We really want you to come in and help build the world. We don't know what it looks like at all. When I first read the script, all the kids were in black leather. And I'm like, I'm not doing black leather. <laughs> it's not happening. Um, so I said, look, I can come in and build the world. I need to go away to my rabbit hole, go away for three months, not be bothered and come back. And, and literally everything I did was a separate contract. So Disney Consumer Products hired me three months prior to even starting as a costume designer. So I didn't have to do things at the same time as being a costume designer. Hired me for three months. I went away, I created this presentation, 400 pages presentation. <laughs> and it had everything. It built the world, the costumes, the hair, music, it like set, like everything. It just built the world, iconic symbols, uh, fun sayings like VKs or scallywag swag. Like it had so many concepts in it. And so once they saw um, the presentation, what they did is I would present to everybody. I presented to all the marketing teams. They brought the music teams in. They brought the writers in. Um, they then started bringing the merchandisers in, Hasbro, Mattel. They would bring them in. It would be 20 people in one meeting, 40 people in another meeting, 20. It was just a road show, <laughs> a comedic road show for all of these departments for Disney. And so my lawyer was able to negotiate that contract. It was completely separate from my costume design contract. So after the three months was over and I had built this world, I then, um, I then had my contract negotiated for costume design. And, and the reason, if you look at Descendants and the costumes and everything, why everything matches so on point is because they involved me. 
three months before we even shot the film. I mean, months and months and months before we even shot the film, which allowed the vendors the time to get things in production. And that is the key. What usually happens is they're working on a movie and then after the movie, hey, let's do some, you know, some costumes. It's too late by then. You've missed your first market. If you go to the toy fair or all these fairs, you've already missed your, your deadlines and your points. So by involving the designer early on, you, they're able to, we had books put together for, they came to visit me in Vancouver, the, uh, the toy companies. I showed them around. We were able to put books together. We were able to put fabric swatches together. We were able to give them um, the vector files for sublimation. That's why everything is so on point is because they had all these things. I was able to hire a team outside of my costume designer and, and go to and go to illustrators that I was able to bring in from 892 to create these things before we even got to production. Then when we got to production, hire them again to move forward with production. Um, anything they needed me to do, they had created an animated series. Oh, you want me to do something for the animated series? Different check, different contract. Oh, you want me to do something? They just had all these little things. Everything is different. I'm not doing anything under my costume design contract, but costume design. I'm not styling anything. I'm not working on anything. Everything is a separate track because that's what you're owed. You're owed separate payment for everything you do. So that's what I did. Everything was a separate contract. Finally, by Descendants 3, I had contributed so much to the franchise, they hired me as accredited creative consultant. So with that, I was uh, overseeing hair, makeup, wardrobe, art department. And so that was a completely separate contract, completely uh, separate pay, but it showed that they valued your contribution to what you gave to the franchise. And that was really, really important because we do so much. The whole look of the whole project that we do is really coming from the costume designer. And the people who do value that are the people who make the money off of the toys and the dolls and the merchandise because they know. And if you want something that is a really profitable franchise, involving the designer is the way to get that. And um, I work with the head of Disney franchise. That's who, that's who I work with on a almost daily basis. And they know the value of the costume designer. So I just wanted to put that out there because I think, you know, of course, one day we would love to get points. That is something <laughs> that we would all love to get. But before that happens, how can we monetize what we do for this franchise? And it is by them hiring you in advance and hiring you for different things and paying you for everything that you do for the franchise. So I just wanted to, 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 to give that a little bit and, and hope that helps um, with just another model of how someone could go about um, um, working with the franchise and making sure that your work is represented the way you want it to be represented. Thank you very much. Um, that's a that's a big one, just because um, I've been on a few projects, I think, where they've kind of tried now to they, to involve the costume designer early. Um, one of them was with Liz Wolf for Jupiter's Legacy. We were on like a months and months before. And just like Karasan, it helped inform the project so much. It really helped everything kind of cohesively stay together. Um, so I do think that there are producers and people that are starting to see you guys' value well ahead of time and knowing what you bring and bringing you in early. And that's something that I know in my career I advocate for constantly is being on projects and seeing that because like, oh, the costume designer needs to be here. They should be here now, like not later now, you know, like right now. Um, so that's something that I think we want to talk about more. Thank you very much, Karasan, for sharing that. Um, I think we're going to open it up to, um, to some questions from the audience. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions, um, but we'll see if we can kind of wait for that. Um, in the meantime, I think that while I've got the panelists, um, I wanted to ask you guys, if there was anything, uh, if you if if you guys want to chime in, if there's anything that you would want to leave with the audience, like a major takeaway or something that you've learned um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, and you guys can just raise your hand and, and, and go for it. Go ahead, Tracy. Um, I just wanted to say that 
you know, over the years, like Linda, Linda and I have tried really hard on various shows for me, you know, or, or movies or whatever. And we've gotten so close and so close and um, it hasn't happened yet, but I really believe that at some point it will. So I, it's more of like a pep talk that if you do want something like this to happen, just keep going for it. And I think eventually it will come to fruition. And um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I've been disappointed a few times, but I'm not going to give up. It's going to happen. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Deirdre? Hi, oh my God, uh, Tracy took the words out of my mouth. Um, yes, Linda and I have been on the phone numerous times trying to make a few things happen and it doesn't always play out. But one thing that I just wanna share with everyone, it takes, it takes a lot of focus. And for me, it takes a lot of you know, impetus to get started. So I just wanna say you know, to everyone, we are all family and it's important to communicate with one another. Our industry is changing rapidly with major tectonic shifts, and I cannot impart how important it is to foster community with one another and to share information because it really only makes the value of who we are stronger when we are united and we are all speaking the same language. So thank you. Sal? Hi. Um, you know, first off, I want to give a big shout out to um Antoinette Messam and Louis Siqueira, who called me a couple of years ago to start this committee. This was really just the beginnings of it, and we needed this information. And they have been so valuable in collecting this information and spreading this. Because, we, again, we only learn from each other. There is no book on it. And we have sort of become the de facto experts. But um, it's really to, to Antoinette and Louis's credit for the hard work. And Samantha, who's now joined as a committee chair, um, it's really we learn from each other. Um, and I think that that speaks volumes to us as costume designers. I think that, you know, Terry, as our new president, has really been active in getting us all to speak. And, and this panel is a two-parter. This first one is for the members so we can discuss this openly. Our second one, we want to have um, studio representatives and agents so that we can discuss this with them. Because I think that as much as we're learning, they're learning to the point that they don't know who we are or what we do. Um, they need to learn from us. And I think that these stories and this experience can can be a valuable asset. And so continue speaking, continue reaching out. There's always, you know, nobody's an expert, but there's always somebody who can get you to somebody. Call the office. The office can refer you to who you need to go to. That's what we're here for. But, um, you know, communicating amongst ourselves is a valuable tool beyond just this committee. Thank you, Sal. JR? Oh, JR, you're muted. Okay, one, th one thing I learned I wanted to shout out is just um, also be careful and very realistic about um, the extra pressures of your collaborations on your department if you're doing it at the same time. Just, I'm shouting that one out uh, because you know, it, it is hard for us to even get compensated for ourselves <laughs> for these kinds of things. And then a lot of times you're on a, you're doing this at the same time. Like Linda said, for the Moda, collab I, I did have three weeks off and that's where i was able to focus and dedicate to the creation of the concept deck and the um financials package but then i started a movie with a totally different crew you know that wasn't associated with amsterdam and um my time was was really intensely taken away but i still had to keep up with all of this um so if you do happen to be in a position where you can you know, you can suggest budgetary to think ahead exactly the same way we do as HODs inside your department. This, this, this world, if you're going for a bigger promotion, just prepare, you know, do what you can for your department to comp get them compensated. I was able to get every illustrator compensated on top of, you know, they were getting paid individually for this project. And, and I also had an ACD um, project manager brought on because I knew I was going to be on the film and I needed a project manager dedicated to being able to respond to Linda and the brand and Moda and the studios exactly when they needed them, regardless of if I was stuck in a fitting or not. A lot of times they're requesting assets, um, like things like, you know, pictures, fitting photos or graphics or things that were generated on the production. So. Do what you can if you're in. You're lucky enough to be in that position. Um, if you can't because you don't have control of the budget, at least be vocal about it. That there aren't just elves, you know, who that there are other people who are who are doing this, um, or maybe scale down, you know, and 
And a lot of times you can um, do one of these collabs with like Linda and collab with a brand and the brand's going to come in with a team for you, you know, and then maybe your cut's not as big because there's a whole team over at the brand that's doing a lot of graphic generation, asset generation, and you're really more of the creative force. And that's great. That's another amazing opportunity and a way for you to get involved while you don't have the time or staff to you know, to do anything bigger. I just wanted to shout out that when we do these things, it does affect our departments when we're on it. So it's a juggle. It's just something to keep in mind. Thank you. And then I can see Karasan, we got another question. Oh, oh, no, I just wanted to second that because one of the things that I did when I was working with consumer products is everybody who worked on my team was paid separately, not just myself. And it's very important to get that in advance and approved. And also for people to know that all of these departments have their own budget. So Disney Consumer Products has a completely separate budget than the, than the production. So a lot of times they pay for things separately, then production pays for something separately, then marketing pays for something separately. So all these departments have their own budget. And so you'll have, you know, you can have checks coming from different departments to make sure that everything is paid for. Say, say it out loud, say it out loud, because they will try and use you as a resource without the money if, if they can get away with it. So you just say it out loud. Absolutely. <laughs> and somehow they find the money. Account. Yeah, no, Sal, go ahead. Sorry. So sometimes they find the money. It's like, they, you know, they, they, they do. don't want to pay it, but they somehow find the money. They do when you point it out. <laughs> I think the other thing. Oh, go ahead, Terry. There we go. Um, yes. I just wanted to say this has been a spectacular town hall. Um, I wish everyone in the guild had been involved to just hear your experiences and your advice. It's phenomenal. The world has changed so much um, in the past 10, 20 years. Well, definitely 10, five years. And um, even for our members who don't feel this, this necessarily is for them just hearing this is valuable and to understand where it's going and what the future is going to be so i can't thank you all enough and for all of our members who are here will you please 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 let everybody know what they missed and um thank you again and uh antoinette lewis sal all of you have just been fabulous in putting this together and the panelists could not be more exciting thank you thank you so that's all i wanted to say i got a couple of questions in here too at least not questions but just like a call for transparency um people praising the fact that everyone's starting to open up and share this information i think it's information that a lot of you guys have wanted um and the the goal of making sure that we have more of these and to do more and to be more transparent about the inner workings of the deals and things like that so that we all have a shot or people have a shot at being able to try and see if they can kind of participate in this um i do want to really quickly i saw that ellen's here ellen Mirajnik's here i wanted to call on her and see if she could maybe speak to her experiences quickly there she is hey, hi <laughs> how are you good um i think that um uh, this has been an extraordinary uh this panel and open town hall today it's been quite wonderful to hear everybody's experiences and and that everybody's experiences are at different at different um different kinds of experiences which i think is the most important thing to understand um i had an experience that recently this year uh because uh shondaland was very um shondaland wanted to start a a um a, a celebration of those who contribute to their shows. And that was called Seat at the Table. And I was the, uh, I was lucky enough and I really felt honored to be the first designer to be asked to be um, the, uh, to become the first designer to have a seat at the table. And that was to collaborate on a jewelry line with uh, Monica Cozan. And we never used any of her things in the show. We just did a, a small collaboration, a small collection 
that was the essence of the show. It was not anything from the show. It was not anything to be used in the show. There were no ties. There were no strings. But it was it was merely something that was I, that I think everyone should do. That everyone who works on a show should have be able to have an open seat at the table because of the contribution that is so. Um, it is it's the whole thing it just tells the whole story we are storytellers we we make the story happen and we make the story happen with very valuable contributions um and seat of the table i hope that i don't know who the second person will be now but i hope it continues on mine was from the bridgerton experience which um i was the first one to create and define and design and create the entire um, look, world, et cetera. And Chandelin was very, 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 very supportive of everything. And it was their way of um, just honoring the collaboration between, between companies and designers and and executives and so on and felt and felt it necessary because of what we contribute. Um, it was wonderful. I got paid some money. The part that gets tricky, however, is that Netflix, the studio, is the one who holds the purse strings. They are the ones that say, Oh, that's all fine and good. You could do whatever you need to do, but we're just going to pay you X, Y, and Z. And and frankly, it's not a lot. It's it was not a lot. It was something, and it, it was something that I had to fight for continually. Actually, up until the day the the line was released. So. Although I am very, very, very um, happy and honored that we were able to create a collaboration and um, and bring something to market, which was just lovely and and the essence of Bridgerton, and it was done with with a collaborator that I really, really um, enjoyed working with. It was a one of it, she was one. Uh, she was presented to me, and it was an immediate yes on my part. Um, if if I didn't really care to work with Monica, I think I could have changed um, the collaborator. But at that particular moment in time, she was absolutely perfect. She still is perfect, and we still will go on to create things together. It is, and, and as I said before, seat at the table, just everybody has to have a seat at the table. And I love that name. I love that category. I love that positioning um, because it just celebrates who we are and what we do and what we contribute um, to everyone that is, it, it just, we, I don't know why I'm at a loss for words, but um, it it just puts, it puts everyone in a proper, in the proper light, I think, um, in a, a, a congratulatory and celebratory way of your work and you're able to use your 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 brain in a different way and I always find that to be fun but that being said there is that issue of getting paid and getting paid for what you have contributed beyond the world that you created and then what what it then leads to but now you're in a collaboration that is well supported. And it, I think collaboration of that sort, just like JR's collaboration was, you must to and and um and everybody who has the support of a studio, the support of a company of a large production company, the support of a person is a hundred percent necessary. Um I think the issue for me becomes beyond that and the studios and how the studio sees it. And in the end, I think that we will win, meaning that we will be able to get everything that we asked for in some way or another. 
because I don't really think it, it's it's too it's become too obvious. There is so much at play when you have everything that we create being adapted into other fields as influence. We are the original influencers, and that is never to be forgotten about how many how many different industries use our work as models. So um, I've always had a really great experience straight down the line in this career that I've had. Um, and to be, as I said, I, I just love the name seat at the table and I love having been the first person to be honored to take that seat. Um, and I hope every single person on this call has the honor of having a seat at their table for whom they work for and what they contribute because it is essential for um, our, our, um, our creative spirit. It's just, that's that's what it is. It's our creative spirit. It has to be celebrated. And we're the first ones to celebrate it. And it's great when the world knows what we're celebrating by ourselves and you can include everybody with. I I mean, I just know that there's so much more to so much more to have and know how 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 much I'm in London now, but how much all that we contribute travels throughout the world and anything that can't be seen in London of all of the work that we're talking about here is seen on computers, is seen on a phone. No one stops it at any, they, they hear about one show, even if it's on Hulu, you can't get it, you get it. So, I mean, it's, it's it's a worldwide enterprise, so um, I think that we're all happy to be part of it and continue to make your voices known. That's I, I don't think it ever stops. I think it's <laughs> the greatest thing in the world. Thank you, all. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to wrap it up because I think we're all we're pretty much done. I we're done with the questions. Um, I wanted to thank everybody. Um, thank you, Antoinette. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, everybody, for organizing this and putting it together, Anna. Um, and thank you for everybody, all of our panelists. You guys did great. And thank you for participating and sharing your stories. Um, I think we will do more of these. Thank you to Ivy for organizing this as well. Um, and I think if you guys have more questions, we have some um, information in the chat uh, from Linda and from Ivy, um, or sorry, for Anna. Um, if you guys want to reach out with more questions, um, and we'll do this again. Um, and then, like Sal said, we'll get into um, more of the weeds of it. Um, now that we've heard how, you know, how these stories have gone. Um, so thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, be creative and go forward knowing that this can happen. You've heard stories of it happening and it's happening more often. Great. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.